All right. The next talk is going to be given by John Keeley. So welcome back, John. Ooh. Maybe. Let's try that again. Whoa. Did I just give away something important? Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing important. Okay, so John is going to be giving Alex Seifert's talk, of which he's also a co-author. Thank yes. you, John. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Alex regrets not being here. She's hopefully temporarily on the East Coast. Um, if any of you have ever heard Alex give a talk, you'll also regret she's not here. Um, I'm going to start this off with sort of a primer about type conversion to give you some ideas about what we know about type conversion. Um, well, that's an interesting technique. I'll have to learn how I did that. Um, one of the uh, way, places to begin is to um, describe what type we think of as vegetation type conversion. It's a change of one vegetation type to another. It's different, though, from ecological changes such as uh, succession, because very often associated with type conversion is a significant change in community composition, the change in resilience and ecosystem services. So we're talking about something that we don't think of as a natural ecological process. Now the idea of type conversion in Chaparral probably dates back to early papers by uh, W.S. Cooper in 1922, Phil Wells in 1962, and they talked about vegetation mosaics in California, primarily in the coast ranges, and pointed out there were these mosaics with chaparral interspersed with annual grasslands of mostly exotic species. And they attributed the origins of these to very early Indian use of fire, which basically loaded the landscape with excessive amount of fire. And these systems were in sort of a quasi-equilibrium when Europeans arrived and brought these exotic species, which invaded very, very quickly. Now, there's been a number of studies that have been done in the last few decades that have addressed issues that we can call type conversion. Probably the earliest that I can think of is this paper by Paul Zedler and his students. And he used the term, there's a new uh, type of vegetation being created because of excessive numbers of fires on a given site. Um, a student of mine uh, and I published a paper in the early 90s and we made reference to vegetation conversion. The first example, and I don't know this definitively because I haven't studied all the literature, but the first example I can come up with where the term type conversion was used was a paper that I did in early 2000s dealing with uh, Native American use of uh, fires. Now, this is an example of what we mean when we think in terms of fire generated type conversion. This entire scene here uh, was burned in 1970 by the Laguna Fire in San Diego County. Uh, this portion was burned again in 2001 by the Viejas Fire. Um, and this part was burned a third time by the Cedar Fire. This is all native uh, reveg here or restoration. Um, this is almost all dominated by Bromus madratensis, which is invaded, and presumably because of this short interval uh, uh, in fires, eliminated many of the uh, native species. Uh, but type conversion can come about in a variety of ways. This is uh, a common means, creating fuel breaks, uh, perhaps excessively large fuel breaks, like this one on the Los Padres, where everything is skate, scraped clean and um, and here's a rare scene with Carla. I think she was saying to Tess Brennan, uh, what happened to all the shrubs? <laughs> and Tess is showing her the burl of one chemise plant that was left on that site. Um, there's some creative type conversions. <laughs> For example, you go to the eastern end of the uh, San Gabriel Mountains, um, and this is a fuel bait break, a cr very creative fuel break. Uh, the green patches are native vegetation that's been left in a very nice style, um, interspersed with the exotics. 
Um, there, here's another example of a type conversion created by mastication. Um, and I remember Hugh Safford saying one time, you know, if you're going to do a mastication treatment, make sure that Fremontia has not done a cover photo of that site prior <laughs> to the mastication. Um, livestock grazing can also be a source of type conversions. Nitrogen deposition has been uh, proposed as one of the causes of type conversion. Um, and almost certainly nitrogen deposition has played an important role in the invasion of uh, exotic annuals and desert environments. On the west side of the mountains, it's less certain. We've done a study where we compared hundreds of sites, couldn't find any evidence on this side of the mountains for nitrogen being involved, in part because we have really extensive type converted areas in coastal sites like this Mission Trails Park in San Diego, uh, extensive type conversion, yet it's uh, very little nitrogen pollution. Uh, vegetation mortality, we heard from Steve Davis yesterday about, uh, and Aaron about vegetation mortality that we've been seeing recently, such as this uh, scene from the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, and it's been proposed as a driver of type conversion. This is a paper that uh, I believe just came out last week, Anna Jacobson and Brandon Pratt, where they have documented this uh, mortality and proposed it as a driver of type conversion. Now, one of the things to understand about type conversion, there are really two types of studies that have proposed type conversion or, or claim to explain uh, drivers behind type conversion. There are what I call empirical studies of changes on the same site, where you look at a site, follow it over time, and you show changes in the vegetation uh, on that uh, particular site. And then there are sites which really look at broad landscape patterns and try and make inferences about the role of type conversion uh, on those sites. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of limitations to empirical studies. Very often they're over a more localized area. Uh, there are problems with uh, making inferences about landscape patterns because there's a lot about those landscapes we often don't know. Um, here's an illustration of an empirical study. This is one that Tess Brennan and I did back in uh, early 2000, where we looked at uh, sites that had burned in 2003, and then those same sites down in San Diego County, after being burned by the 2003 Cedar Fire, were burned again uh, by the Witch Fire in 2007. And you can see the impact of double fires over short intervals on those sites. These are uh, alien annuals here in 2004, the first year after the uh, Cedar Fire. Here it is in 2005. Uh, and then the site burned again in 2007. And this is what the alien annuals look like after the second fire event. So this is what we see empirically as evidence of uh, type conversion on these uh, sites. Now, this uh, figure you've already seen, Marty showed this. This is a study that was, uh, in fact, um, just published in a book that you might want to take a look at right over here. Um, this is a chapter Alex uh, has in that book where she's documented the uh, changes in, from shrub to grassland in the coast ranges. This is like Santa Barbara up here and San Diego down here. And the purple indicates areas that over the last 70 years have converted from uh, shrubland to grassland. Now, there's an, a recent paper done here on the Angeles, which is certainly of interest to the question of type conversion. This paper by Park et al. Uh, published earlier in the year, basically documented the pattern of herbaceous cover uh, across uh, the Angeles, much of the front side of the Angeles, very heavily dominated by shrublands, other areas more heavily dominated by uh, herbaceous vegetation. Uh, and the inference is some of this is likely due to type conversion. Part of the problem is not knowing exactly what the drivers are when we're making inferences about landscapes, for example. And this is some of the patterns that were uh, noted in the park at all paper. Uh, in other words, the amount of herbaceous cover is a function of annual precipitation on the site. So drier sites tend to have more herbaceous cover. So it appears that precipitation might be an important driver. Um, 
and moisture uh, deficit in general, solar radiation as it goes up, herbaceous cover goes up. They were able to document how the systems went from heavily shrub dominated to herbaceous dominated based on site characteristics related to uh, site aridity. And they come up with a model that explains, a, or at least points out a number of the important characteristics driving a switch from shrubs to herbaceous cover. Uh, disturbance is certainly one of those. Fire is an important part of it. But here's a problem that we run into when we try and make inferences based on landscape patterns in fire history. And that is we don't have a fire history map that allows us a very precise determination of what the history is at a single 30 meter pixel, which is what these studies are looking at because the FRAP fire history database, very useful for a lot of things, may not be very good for picking out uh, fire history on individual sites. Uh, this is uh, just one illustration of where you can run into problems. And that is, this is the fire history from the FRAP uh, database in Riverside County for three year period. And that's how much of Riverside burned according to the FRAP database. But if you take the total fire history based on all the fires uh, of any size, there are many, many sites that have burned that are not captured in the FRAP database. If you're trying to take a 30 meter pixel and say what the fire history is in that pixel, you can run into problems. For example, we did a study uh, in the early 2000s where we had something like 250 sites that had burned in the 2003 Cedar Fire. And we looked at the FRAP database to determine how old the site was. Then we would enter each of these sites and we cut down uh, a skeleton from one of the obligate seeding shrubs, which is a good measure of stand age. And we found that about 53% of the sites had a stand age that was the same between the uh, uh, ring counts we had and the FRAP database. In other words, a lot of the FRAP database is not necessarily capturing all the fires on the landscape. And the ring counts almost inevitably suggested that site was younger than the FRAP database uh, indicated, suggesting that uh, on a small fine scale, you might miss a lot of fires. Um, on the Angeles, certainly if we're interested in herbaceous cover, we have to recognize that a lot of the Angeles uh, has fuel breaks and those fuel breaks have been type converted to herbaceous vegetation. So this is uh, a, an example of where we're seeing herbaceous cover and it's intentionally done to create uh, uh, fuel conditions. Now, the uh, study that uh, Alex uh, primarily wanted to address in this talk is uh, uh, a study that's currently in review. And what uh, Alex and Tess, uh, Brennan and myself did is we uh, used aerial photography in the Santa Monica Mountains and we took 800 random plots in the mountains, uh, 30 meter pixel plots, and we uh, asked the question, for those plots that had chaparral, dense uh, contiguous chaparral in the 1940s, uh, what did uh, they look like uh, in 2014? And then evaluated the amount that had uh, converted from chaparral to grasslands. And so we have a picture across this range of um, how chaparral has changed. In short, what uh, we found is about a third of the sites had either completely switched from shrubs to herbaceous vegetation during that period of time. And then we took a, a number of site factors and asked the question, what drivers are most closely associated uh, with that switch? And uh, the dark uh, field bars indicate complete conversion and the lighter bar indicates the majority of that pixel had been uh, converted. And then these are some of the factors we looked at. Certainly the uh, factor that comes out strongest is available soil water capacity. The drier sites had much, were much more likely to experience type conversion than other sites. Uh, but there are other factors that were important too, for example, uh, distance to trails, the historical fire frequency, 
uh, and the minimum fire interval were also important uh, drivers. And based on these uh, uh, analysis, uh, we created a uh, hierarchical uh, description of what the important drivers were and for full type conversion, majority type conversion. And basically, in both cases, the important driver was the available water uh, uh, on the site. In other words, the driest sites were the ones most likely to be type converted. But the other factor that's very strong is a minimum fire interval of less than 10 years. Now, the question is, is how do we evaluate what are the important drivers of type conversion? One way to look at this is say, well, both available water capacity uh, and short interval fires are involved. But it may be a little more complicated than that. I tend to, and it's probably because I spend most of my life studying fires, I tend to think the minimum fire interval of less than 10 years is probably the big uh, driver. One of the reasons this might not come up uh, as the important determinant is because we don't have a perfect understanding of what the fire history is because we're using uh, fire maps that may not be particularly accurate. And, but I think the reason that available water uh, capacity is such an important driver is that's where the species that are most vulnerable to type conversion occur. The Ceanothus, obligate seeding Ceanothus that um, Frank Davis, uh, excuse me, Steve Davis talked about yesterday, uh, those species, Ceanothus gregii, Ceanothus cuneatus, uh, and varicosus, all tend to occur on the driest uh, sites. And this is illustrated by a nice paper done a number of years ago um, where different chaparral species were ranked in terms of their site preferences. And this is Ceanothus megacarpus, Ceanothus crassifolius, two of the ones that Frank, or excuse me, Steve talked about yesterday. They tend to occur on sites with the lowest soil moisture, um, the greatest variability in moisture, the greatest solar radiation, air temperatures. In other words, the species most vulnerable to type conversion are the ones that occur on the driest sites. And that's why I think uh, site aridity turns out to be an important determinant of uh, type conversion. And then lastly, in this paper, uh, we've generated probabilis probabilistic maps that represent areas potentially suitable for vegetation type conversion in the Santa Monica Mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, these areas in red and yellow tend to be the areas we think are the most vulnerable to future uh, type conversion. And then lastly, I'll just point out one of the things I think that we know about type conversion is it's an interaction between disturbance, primarily fire, and site aridity, and that as uh, disturbance frequency changes, the amount of herb cover will go up in a different pattern, depending on whether you're talking about a mesic site or a xeric site. In other words, if you're looking at xeric sites, it takes relatively low disturbance frequency to type convert that site. But if you're looking at very mesic sites, it's going to take a lot more disturbance uh, to get there. And I'll end it there. Thank you.